Hello, and welcome to Shelby Speaks, the concurrency of our classrooms. I'm Adam Watson, the Digital Learning Coordinator here at Shelby County Public Schools. The word concurrency in our vodcast title reflects the reality of many of our classrooms this school year. Classrooms that are a hybrid of students in person and students at home, often being facilitated by a teacher simultaneously, but is also an intentional nod to the idea of metaphorical currency in our instruction. In the spring of 2020, our educators were forced to pedagogically invest in new innovative strategies to effectively teach in an emergency distance learning environment. As spring became fall, we faced new challenges, and we are thankful for our spring 2020 investment in growing our learning. Our teachers are spending and trading the pedagogical capital built last school year in order to innovate and collaborate even further this school year. Part of that collaboration involved the creation of a district concurrent classroom Google Doc full of tips, resources, and videos where educators shared with each other how to navigate through our common challenges. It is selections from these videos that we are highlighting in our latest podcast series. In this episode, we hear from Jonathan Kidwell and Jessica Mudd, both science teachers at Martha Lane Collins High School. Via a screencast, they share their course mastery scales based on state standards, how the language of these mastery scales are used in assessments, and the importance of student self-reflection and self-assessment. Jonathan and Jessica also discuss how students in these concurrent classrooms have both in-person and virtual options to demonstrate their learning. Hey everybody, today Ms. Mudd and I are going to be sharing with you all um, a little bit about assessments, kind of give you an example of how we're using our standards and mastery scales to create these assessments, and a little bit about how we're incorporating the language of these mastery scales into the assessments so that students can really get a good understanding of what these different complex skills are that go into the standard and how they can reach mastery on those skills. Um, so like I said, I'm going to give you kind of an example today of how we've used our standards because I know everybody's are different um, and how we create an assessment from that. In this standard, HSPS 18B, so we actually had to split this up because 18A or 18PS18 is very large, so we had to split it into A and B. In this one, we're looking to develop models to illustrate the changes in the composition of the nucleus of the atom and the energy released during nuclear fission and fusion. So the big words there, develop models to illustrate, that's kind of what this whole standard um, is all about, it's kind of the backbone of this standard. And then if you've used mastery scales before, here are all the complex skills that go into that idea. So there's five different ones here that we want to assess so that students can show mastery of this entire standard. Um, so these are all the different complex skills. Uh, in this assessment today, we actually are using three of these. Um, we're assessing three of these different skills in this assessment. You do not have to use all of them, and you don't have to use, or you can just use one, you can use two, you can use all five. It doesn't matter, um, just as long as you get to all of these different skills so that students can really um, show mastery of this standard. In our assessment today, we're actually looking at three of these, like I said. So these first two, where we're describing how fission and fusion processes work, kind of modeling how that those processes work and then illustrating how both fission and fusion may release energy and may require initial energy for their reactions to take place. So we looked at these three, we left the other two out because we didn't think they were as relevant or as close as the other three were. So in this assessment, we actually um, are creating a poster. In this poster, we have fusion on one side and fission on the other, and they are modeling these nuclear reactions. So they're creating the models of these reactions. Um, on both of the different processes, they have to clearly label and model each process, represent all involved particles and provide a clear key, represent the energy input and output of each system, and we went even a little above and beyond what the uh, mastery scale incorporated. In ours, we had them provide a real life example of each process so that they can describe how that process, is, that process works in a real life example. So if they're talking about fusion, how fusion powers the sun, um, if they're talking about fission, how that's used in things like nuclear power plants, things like that. And they have to really kind of explain how that process works in those different examples. Um, we actually found a way for students to do this both in person and virtually, um, you know, with the whole COVID situation. Uh, but in person, they could even do this at home. But if they wanted to do this kind of by their 
artistic ability, which is something I don't have. Um, they can create a poster, just bringing their own supplies, using that um, to draw out the processes um, and model those, label them, and write about them a little bit. So they would do that in person um, by hand, or they could do it virtually. They could use a graphic design website like Canva or Photoshop or whatever they wanted to use um, to create this poster where they modeled these processes and wrote about their information as well. So that's kind of two different ways students could do this. Um, and then below here, so this is kind of like a to-do list. Here is the actual criteria that they're looking for when they're creating their uh, creating their poster so everything that they need to incorporate right and if you look here we have what you're doing well where you need to improve on two sides in the middle we have the criteria this criteria is actually taken directly from the mastery scale so what's in bold is just copy and pasted so these three um, complex skills is just copy and pasted to here and those are the three skills that we're assessing in the criteria section under that we have a little bit about what shows or what's necessary to reach this criteria. So for example, here is the skill that we're looking for students to show mastery of, and here's what all is incorporated in that. So elements are all correctly labeled in all the different processes, uh, or in all the parts and processes for fusion. All particles are actually represented before, during, and after, and it includes those real life examples. So they have to be able to describe fusion, describe fission, and then in another one, the energy and output are accurately represented, or accurately represented um, by illustrating how that works in both fission and fusion, maybe comparing and contrasting that. So that's what we're looking for. And then how we graded this um, is based on this scoring rubric down here. So a four level work has a model that illustrates and describes what's happening to elements during both processes and the energy and how that's changing in either the input or output. Something that might fall a little bit short um, is students create a model that demonstrates and describes the parts of the processes, but maybe they don't have the energy piece or something like that. Maybe they're just missing, uh, missing out on a little bit of these different skills. Um, two level work just kind of shows the basic understanding. So it creates a model that labels all the parts correctly. Um, but maybe they don't describe it, right? Because we want them to be able to describe these models as well. So not just draw, but also understand what's happening in that image. So maybe they just create the model, but they can't really describe it. And then one level work, maybe they're missing something in their model or something's messed up a little bit there. Then that would be one level work. And then zero, they do not submit or it's completely irrelevant to what we're talking about. So that's kind of how we built our assessment and our rubric and kind of how we went about this. Uh, Ms. Mudd's going to talk a little bit about the uh, feedback process, kind of how we gave students feedback, how we had them self-assess as well, and then um, the reflection piece to kind of top that all off. So Kidwell talked about how we created the mastery scales and used that specific language to create this rubric. I know everyone's mastery skills are a little bit different, but we can all incorporate the language of the scales and make it familiar to our students. So the rubric that we created, it's just a basic one point rubric. Our criteria is what students need to reach to receive a level four on our mastery scales. And we have our glows and our grows on the sides. So we've seen these one point rubrics. A lot of us have already been using them, but I'm gonna go in to how we use this in our feedback cycle. I would show you a sample, but the majority of my students completed the work on paper and I don't have those with me currently. A big part of our feedback cycle for this assessment was having the students self-assess their posters using the rubric. So what they think they did well on and what they think they could improve on. Obviously, Kidwell and I, we did go through and we graded using this rubric but before we did that is when they did their self-assessments. And so these self-assessments require students to actually read and think about each criteria in the rubric, which is gonna help further familiarize them with the language of the mastery scales. It's also a really good opportunity to catch any misconceptions and make corrections before the final submission, which is gonna lessen the need for remediation down the road. So our point is that we want 
kids to reach mastery. And if we can help them do that the first time, that's even better. Then one thing that we talked about in our PLCs after we'd given this assessment and giving the rubrics back with our glows and grows was having students do a peer assessment with the rubric prior to turning in. So not only are they self-assessing, they're also doing a peer assessment which is always good because sometimes our own eyes, we're not catching what we might be missing and someone else might catch that. So that could help them even grow even more. And again, lessen the need for remediation after the first submission. And then another thing we talked about was having students tell us why they received the score they did prior to giving back their grade, graded rubrics with the glows and grows. So before we give them the feedback, before we tell them why they received their grade, on another assessment, we want them to tell us why they received their grade using the rubric that we've given them. So this would allow students to pinpoint exactly which area they still needed to grow in in regards to the mastery scale and help them understand even more that the grades tie back to the mastery scale always and where their knowledge lies on that scale. So I think a lot, I know a lot of my students had difficulty understanding that their grade ties back to something. And I think if they're using that rubric to tell us why they received a grade and give their own justification, they can understand where our justifications are coming from. And I think that would help with a lot of the confusion sometimes that surrounds mastery grading. Because us as teachers really understand it but I think sometimes students need help getting there also.